This is episode 19 of the History of Podcast. You should you should know us by now. I'm Robert. And I'm Emma. And today we are talking about the history of the guitar. Now, before we get into the episode, let me just plug our YouTube channel. It's also called The History of. It, it's another way that we uh, publish our podcast. Another directory, yeah. Another directory. And we also have an Instagram called The History of Podcast. And the link for both of those is in the show notes. And uh, before we get right into the episode... As always, we have the egg carton count. Oh, yes. And today's egg carton count is... It's uh, 24 today. Woohoo! Yeah, we're staying above our episode number. So if you don't know, our goal is to keep our egg carton count above our episode number. So we're, we're, doing we're achieving well right that now. goal. Yeah. yeah. So this episode is near and dear to my heart because I've played guitar since I was about 10. Now, for all those guitar fanatics, I do have an acoustic guitar and an electric guitar and they're both made by the fender brand each i got each instrument uh second hand and they were both in great condition and they've both served me well the electric guitar is a new purchase and needless to say i was ecstatic about it if you knew me you probably knew that i got it and i was telling you about it multiple times because i was just <laughs> so excited it's a beautiful red color okay yes we can move on now okay so about the history of the guitar uh, some, actually some would think the guitar is a recent invention. This is not true. However, well, the, um, the cousins of the guitar have been around for, for centuries. Uh, many string instruments have been formed through the years, you know, helping to create the modern day guitar. The first guitar is thought to have dated back to 4,000 years ago. The earliest proof that we have travels all the way back to around 1900 to 1800 BC in Babylonia. It was here that clay plaques were found with pictures of humans performing upon items which appear to be quite similar to the modern day guitar. And uh, another ancient instrument. So that was like, wow, was that, was that, that's got to be a first where something didn't start in Egypt that all the way back, like, mm. I don't know. But another ancient instrument was found in an Egyptian tomb, so I guess everything passed through Egypt. Um, and this this instrument found in an Egyptian tomb uh, could originate uh, between we're not quite sure between 30 BC and 400 AD. Um, there's that's quite a big window, but you know dating is hard. And uh, this this instrument that was found in the Egyptian tomb featured uh, the the back was flat, and uh, the the front and back were attached to create a sound box. And it had much, it had profound curves on the side, um, much more than the previous instruments. And so that's these features are really foundational in creating what we know as the guitar. Europeans were not left out of the evolution of the guitar. Romans made advancements to similar instruments, making them more guitar-like by composing them completely out of wood, including the formerly rawhide soundboards. This improvement was quite important because it resulted in a much firmer instrument than before. And, like, while, while guitar-like objects seem to be all around the world, they were in Egypt, Babylonia, uh, Europe, um, the actual guitar originates in Europe. And uh, here, the earliest noted instrument with strings existed around 200 AD. And uh, one type displayed a round sound box uh, with a neck comparable to the popular lute. As time went on and the European Middle Ages came about, many kinds of, quote, plucked instruments burst into existence. Now, if you lived during the Renaissance, you have probably heard, you, you would have probably heard the word Vuela. V vuela? Is it? I think that's how you say it. Yeah. Vuela was a general term describing a class of instruments that we would deem guitar-like. For example, Vuela de Arco, wow, I butchered that, was the bowed version of the instrument, but the Vuela de Mano meant the instrument was plucked by the player's fingers or with the player's fingers. And by the 16th century, uh, many of the various instruments uh, got got lost in people's memories um while others achieved heightened popularity so we're, we're kind of like weeding out the the it's the natural selection of instruments Ooh, that's an interesting way to put it yeah meanwhile the fuela took a new meaning and was identified with the plucked variation 
For a period of time, the fuela was appreciated in Spain as much as the lute was elsewhere in Europe. During Spain's Golden Age, the music of vuelaistas, I believe that's how you say it, vuelaistas, vuelaistas, was prized and resulted in the recording of their works in music books. These books appeared quite similar to the music books of lutes. However, no collections of music books were written for lutes in Spain, showing dislike of the lute in favor of the vuela. And uh, just in case you didn't know. Uh, quick aside, we've been talking about, you know, we've been mentioning the lute a couple times, and uh, the lute is, it's like a more egg-shaped medieval guitar, and uh, it was a little bit smaller than the guitars we have today, a little more egg-shaped, and uh, the top of the neck, like where you tune it, what did, what do you say that was called? Is it called the, the tuning head? I think it's the headstock. The headstock? Um, anyway, that is tilted 90 degrees backward. It looks kind of weird, but I guess it makes more sense when you think about it practically, um, and... So yeah, that's the lute. Uh, but while this musical upheaval was occurring in Europe, the first actual guitars finally came about. And these guitars, uh, which are comparable to modern day guitars, were high pitched and featured four pairs of strings instead of six solitary strings. So was it like, I know there's there's 12 string guitars today, so it would be like a four string guitar, except like with the double strings, you know? Maybe. So I believe when... There's the what you're talking about, the double strings. They're called courses, as far as I understand. Okay. I, mean, I need to kind of double check later. But so it's if one, the, like they had different divisions where the strings were, and if there was like in the division there were multiple strings, that's called a course, from what I understand. Okay, you know more about this than I do. Just a smidge. And uh, as a result of uh, the these uh, four pairs of strings, there were melodic restrictions um, when playing the instruments, and this changed when the uh, Libro Primo de la Decla Declaración de Instrumentos Musicales by uh, Spaniard Juan Bermudo was published in 1555 AD. And Bermudo said that the range could be lengthened by installing a single string, quote, a fourth above the present course. And as you can imagine, this expanded the range of the guitar's musical capacity. The guitar did not stay in Spain forever. Spanish conquistadors first brought the guitar to the Americas during the 1500s. The native population was introduced to the instrument by Franciscan monks. While visiting a colony in Mexico, Thomas Gage noted that the Native American youth were dancing, quote, after the Spanish fashion to the sound of the guitar. And as time went on in the 18th and 19th centuries came about, uh, guitars enjoyed, you know, modernization, popularity. Uh, it was made larger and the uh, internal bracing was improved. Uh, the number of strings changed from five to six pairs, uh, then to six individual strings, even though we do have some six paired string guitars today. We have some wacky guitars today. We'll <laughs> yeah. talk about that later. The frets were converted from being made uh, out of gut to inset metal. Now, what is gut? Well, what do you think it is? Like actual, really? I think so. Okay. Again, I can double check that, but I think so, yes. Even the tuning changed from, you know, little wooden pegs uh, to more mechanical geared heads. During the middle of the 1800s, the popularity of the guitar increased significantly in both Europe and the United States of America. While this was occurring, the German man, Christian Frederick Martin, staked his claim in the guitar world. With lawsuits from competitors pressuring Martin to stop crafting guitars, he took his family to America to start anew. Eventually, he entered Nazareth, Pennsylvania, and decided to open a guitar shop there. His family-owned business is still in operation today and is called C.F. Martin & Company. I'm sure you've heard of it, especially if you... Martin Guitars? Yeah, Martin Guitars. If you own a guitar, you may or may not have a Martin Guitar, and if you do, congrats. Yeah. Martin's business has received worldwide recognition. Yeah, and uh, the guitar, so the guitar over time has been tweaked and made even more unique uh, with the coming and going of different trends. In the 1920s and 30s, guitarists wanted the instrument to be louder, and to solve this problem, some manufacturers uh, issued bigger guitar bodies. Other tr others tried to attach pickups um, to the body of the guitar, and uh, the best the best response to the uh, to amplifying a guitar was the 
amplophonic resonator. Uh, that was a style of guitar. And uh, the sound waves would bounce off metal cones within the metal body and produce a louder tone. During the 1950s, Mario McAfee attempted to sell plastic guitars. Although they had been advertised as being of good quality and low prices, I mean, who doesn't love a low There's price? There's no way. They still didn't sell as well as his previously released plastic ukulele. Production slowed to a stop of plastic guitars near the end of the 1960s. Yeah, that's not going to work. But, you know, when the 1960s came around, even more trends, it seemed like people would accept anything. And it was then that the company uh, Microfrets released the guitar named the Orbiter. And it was the first wireless electric guitar. Why don't? Why aren't we still using those today? I mean, we might. Yeah, I, I just I I haven't even heard one. of this. But, like, apparently it's been around since the 60s. I guess this was, you know, pioneering some wireless technology. Maybe not. There was stuff around, but, you know, with the guitar in the 1960s. Anyway, an FM radio transmitter was installed into the instrument, which communicated with a receiver off stage. Uh, so it was using FM radio. And this receiver then sent sound waves to the amplifiers, making the wireless electric guitar possible. In the late 1980s, notable jazz guitarist Pat Metheny asked Canadian Linda Manzer to construct a guitar with, quote, as many strings as possible. The result was a 42-string guitar dubbed the Picasso. That's essentially just a harp. Like, why isn't... It's just a harp at this point. We can attach a picture in the show notes, link a picture in the show notes. It is crazy looking. It's pretty cool, though. Looks like a fun, interesting, confusing guitar. Picasso. There are only two Picasso-style guitars in the world. This is because in 1995, a collector named Scott Chinnery saw the instrument in a magazine and wanted one for his own. Chinnery notified Manzer and had her build the strictly acoustic Picasso too. I feel like that ruins it. There should only be one, you know? I mean, he's the collector dude. But so yeah, there should only be one. You would think. But I mean, it seems like a pretty cool thing. I wouldn't mind having one of those. <laughs> well... The guitar, as, we, uh, as we've learned by now, is not a recent invention. String instruments have dated back to 1900 BC. And after the actual guitar was conceived, it was not long until it made its way to the new world. In the past 100 years, man has tweaked the guitar to align with the trends of the era, which shaped the guitar as we know it today. And if you have any questions or comments about the information provided in this episode, please contact us at the history of 365 at gmail.com. Have a blessed day. And you've got to promise me something. Never, ever, ever stop learning. <laughs>